Good smiles. I'd like to see that. How's Neil? <laughs> Good. <laughs> we were talking about uh, endless consciousness being like the matrix this morning on interviews and uh, like seeing the, the code, the coding of the matrix. And I, I said, go Neo, meditate. <laughs> He's like, okay, Morpheus. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is basically the, the discourse uh, that uh, gave rise to all of this. So the six R's, uh, Bhante's kind of uh, discovery uh, around, around all, all of this, rediscovering the original discourses. Uh, at that time, Bhikkhu Bodhi just came out with the new translation of Majjhima Nikaya, with, um, which was actually from Jnana Moli Bhante, but uh, he kind of took it up and finished it and published it. Uh, I wanted to know, just so uh, I read the poem I wrote to Bhante last night after the talk. Um, I was going to start from there and then um, there's an element I want to bring into this. Uh, would you like to hear the poem again or should I just start uh, cold turkey? Hear it again? Okay, because I wasn't sure, you know, after two and a half hours <laughs> Usually, sometimes uh, some brain function starts to shut down, and uh, <laughs> so I wasn't sure if it was uh, opportune. So I thought I'd give you the the choice. This is a bit dark. Oh, okay. So this is the the forest elder, and so basically, this is going to be the beginning of the story of the talk where. I'm basically leaving Dhammasukha and I'm saying this to Bhante and basically a little bit of a story after. The Forest Elder. When there is a clear cut, Reverend said, they leave an elder standing, not laid, to show the way, shelter and sway. For the young to grow from the seeds he sowed. For the elder is wise many seasons in his eyes. Now he takes all the blows, the four winds bend him low. But he stands still, not shaken nor dismayed. In his heart love is filled, for he knows the true way. In an era laid bare, the seekers find a pair. Up this mighty trunk stare, a mind of heartwood shattering despair. A tamed lion in the savanna, a noble friend in samsara, an elder of the Dhamma, grandfather of the Sangha. May many find their way under his shelter and sway, ardent and resolute they, Break free and homage pay, sheltering him in return from the four winds, taking turns, oasis for the shadeless, a virtuous, loving forest. And so, with all this love in my heart for my teacher, and um, Ending in a last session in front of his porch, uh, where he's sitting on his big chair and his rocking wooden rocking chair. And I'm just about to leave to catch my flight to Canada. And he gives me his permission to teach, well, actually, before that, but, and uh, tells me to teach people in Canada. <laughs> I take my flight and then I leave. Oh, and uh, I ask my mom if, if we can uh, offer, because I can't, I don't handle money, because technically monks can't handle money. So I asked my mom if we could get Bhante some flowers and uh, I managed to get him some, uh, uh, a dozen of roses, which was uh, really nice uh, to put on his porch and uh, three, three to David, actually. <laughs> That. And then catching my flight and going to Canada where I have no community and uh, I'll be living there as a 
forest monk uh, solitary uh, going for alms and I managed to find a place in a really beautiful um, retreat center which was called Mountain Waters and it was um, pretty high on the mountain three and a half kilometers up a forestry road. It's fall in Canada and it's getting colder, it's going, going to, towards winter. I strapped my boots on and uh, walked down my mountain from my kuti in the forest. It's been maybe two weeks. I'm in Canada now trying to go for alms. It's not very successful. <laughs> People think I'm carrying a drum around and that's my alms bowl. And, uh, or at best, they think it's a singing bowl. They ask me, oh, where are you playing tonight? <laughs> I'm like, this is actually for food. <laughs> and uh, I'm wearing quite a, a few layers. Uh, it's getting quite cold. Leaves are turning into colors and falling. And now I'm, uh, I'm walking down the main strip. This is like, uh, it's three and a half kilometers to the edge of town where I kind of come out of the forest and the mountain and uh, kind of enter the village. It's really like in the suttas, you know, like when he said, he took up his bowl and robe and entered the village for alms. That's really how it felt. And then I'm walking down the, the highway, the main strip there. Um, and really soon, it was two weeks after I came, then uh, I see uh, this, this uh, I hear something running after me and I'm kind of <laughs> walking down the highway and there's a Eurishini here running after me and uh, I'm like turning around and she's like, Pante. <laughs> Well, what are you doing? Where, are you, where do you stay? What, what's going on? And um, she's offering like these, uh, I remember those date, date, uh, that, these date fig bars. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I still remember them in my bowl because it was quite, you know, uh, my alms round was not very successful. I, I was basically ending up in Salvation Army and uh, free food banks. And uh, that's how I survived for quite a while, uh, eating with the homeless uh, in a town where I actually lived before. <laughs> and so uh, it was really interesting, a very different tone to my life there. Um, but uh, yeah, these, uh, these wonderful people, uh, Yershini and Hiran, which you, you've seen, I just wanted to put that in because it's, this is a very special retreat and um, I, I think it's really special to have you uh, here because uh, I don't think people uh, here really know the story but uh, that was maybe two and a half years ago and um, Hiran and Yurishini and the little baby, we call her Buddha baby, uh, <laughs> Ria which uh, she was born in, in Nelson, right? And uh, a few, few weeks after she was born, she came to the hermitage. And so basically Hiran and Yurishini have been like supporting me since very, very early uh, offering food. And uh, in Canada, I would come down for alms in the village and uh, Yurishini would cook and uh, I would meet her at the campus. And uh, that was like the first building on my way out of the forest. Uh, it's really nice to, um, to have some of the community, the Canadian community in India. Isn't that amazing? Um, and so there's so, much, there's so much to say around that, but uh, so much insecurity that uh, came, you know, through, through this, this journey and not really knowing, you know, I was uh, mostly hanging out in the in churches because that's where all the food was. <laughs> um, basement of the Anglican church every Friday uh, at noon. And uh, Salvation Army was uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. I still remember. That was from uh, 9 until 11. And um, there was another place, the ODB, Our Daily Bread. And these were all churches. And they would see this Buddhist monk walk in. <laughs> 
with his uh, mountain boots and uh, basically some days I would wake up and there would be like this much snow and uh, walk down to, to the village and put my boots on and my mountain boots and gaiters and crampons and uh, yeah, my three layers of robes and wool shirts and I had a wool robe too. It was really interesting, but uh, anyways, long story short, uh, through all this insecurity, it felt like um, whatever was going to happen, um, when, you know, when you know this kind of teaching, it's like um, you feel protected anyways, like whatever happens to you, you feel like things can only go so wrong, like there's only a limit, because you know, at that point, like, things can only be better <laughs> when you're like, uh, you don't know where you're going to eat. Uh, you don't know if you're going to eat. There's some days I just wouldn't even eat. I remember one day going to town and it's like six kilometers basically just to walk down to the main strip and it's, it's family day <laughs> and nothing's open. <laughs> and so I don't get to eat <laughs> and I get to walk back my mountain six kilometers. Um, I was really fit <laughs> and it's like winter, it's like minus 10. So, uh, but inside it felt like still it was fine, you know, it was, I was kind of feeling like things were fine anyways, like there was these like outside kind of sit conditions that were not perfect, but um, somehow I felt like something was just meant to happen uh, or whatever that was going to be. Uh, and then I met a lot of people on alms, Yurishini and Hiran and Marty, who did an illegal U-turn to like, catch the monk or whatever that was. And um, yeah, many, many people I met like that and slowly uh, it started to grow. And this brings me to uh, basically change lanes now because I wanted to uh, um, kind of bridge over from last night and uh, talk a little bit more just because we have some special guests here and uh, this is like such a special retreat in so many ways. Uh, uh, many special people I, I believe are here uh, and Bante I think also uh, did the same uh, in his own story. And this is where I, I kind of want to change lanes into Bante's, uh, Bante's original story and uh, how this all happened, where he was. And please, Venerable, help me along with this story because uh, if I'm missing any, any bit, that would be nice to have a complete record of, well, not complete record, but So, um, basically, at some point, um, Bhante Vimal Ramsey was practicing Mahasi-style Vipassana for uh, roughly 20 years. And this ended in um, doing many extended retreats in Burma. Uh, retreats for many months then a one-year retreat, and then I think the last one was a two-year retreat, which is quite, quite a good retreat. <laughs> and he went... Um, <laughs> can you imagine having uh, Bliss Bunnies for two years? That would be... He said like a total of five years on retreat. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, like 50,000 hours of meditation. That's Ooh. a lot of sitting. We've got some data here. <laughs> Good. Sleeping like two hours a night sometimes. And yes. The teachers over there are really strict. Mm -hmm. So he said one time it was four hours, and then they told him to cut it down to two hours. Like tripled his rice intake, but he's just losing all his weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, he practiced with many many teachers. Um, like some some of the main leading figures of that tradition. And basically, he, he went through all of this process. Uh, I don't know if you've read the Manual of Insight. It's quite, it's quite a brick uh, by Mahasi Sayadaw. Um, and it, it, that pretty much explains his whole, his whole teaching. 
And he uh, basically, uh, he was sponsored to go to Burma at some point by some Malaysian uh, Dayakas sponsors. Uh, and uh, when he came back, they wanted him to teach uh, what he had learned basically after his two year retreat. Uh, because he was also told that he could teach now that, that, that particular uh, method, um, but he didn't feel very satisfied with what he learned, even though he'd gone through all the insight knowledges and went through this whole path, basically, that was laid down. Uh, he didn't feel like it was actually happening the way that it was supposed to be, or he wasn't happy, not satisfied with the teaching. And so when these, uh, that Malaysian community asked him to teach them what he had learned, he's like, I'm not teaching you this. <laughs> and he taught them loving kindness, basically, instead. Um, yeah. And just to, to clarify what you were saying as well, like his teachers basically told him that he was uh, that he was enlightened, you know, that he had reached the at least the first stage of awakening, and he was not seeing a personality shift or a personality change the way that he would have expected from something that substantial. So. He thought there was something up here, you know, this can't be it. And so, fast forward a little bit, and he was uh, asked by um, Keshri Damananda, uh, who was quite a prominent figure, figure in Buddhism um, at that time especially, to give talks and help him at his uh, temple in Malaysia. And um, at some point, this is when uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, released uh, the, the first like, contemporary translation of the Majjhima Nikaya, the medium length uh, discourses of the Buddha uh, from the Pali Canon. And this was an, a, a work from Nyana uh, Modi. Mm. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi basically finished his work. Uh, it was just like a bunch of, uh, like a pile of sheets that were basically uh, his, his work of translation and he just took it and finished it. And that came out and Bhante started to read this and he started to basically, you know, uh, it's really common to take in Theravada Buddhism, uh, to take um, the Visuddhimagga, uh, which is a kind of a compendium on supposedly what, what the Buddha taught. Um, uh, it's, it's really common that people will just take the Visuddhimagga as uh, the all in all, like a meditation guide, basically, and follow what's in there. Yet, this is a work that came out probably a thousand years after the Buddha's passing. And uh, it is, when, when one reads it and then one reads the suttas, one can definitely tell that there is uh, quite, quite a lot that is different uh, from the, the original texts to, to this. Because mainly it is not only inspired from the suttas themselves, but from a lot of commentaries and sub-commentaries, which were written much later. Without Bhante just started reading this book, and he was so amazed to read the Buddha's own words, and really was impressed by what he was reading. And he thought, you know, like, wow, like I've been using this uh, Visuddhimagga for a long time, and he really, like, he really knew it a lot really well, and that was like his Bible, basically, um, or his meditation guide. Uh, but now his interest started to shift, and he was really attracted to the wisdom of the Buddha in his original discourses. And one sutta in particular was the Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, uh, which we'll talk about tonight a little bit, uh, just after this brief introduction. <laughs> and so he was so impressed that he decided to take leave from the monastery where he was uh, giving talks and teaching and um, 
he decided to leave to a cave in Thailand just so that he could actually practice in that way because he was like, yeah, I, I have to, like, I have to try this. He was starting to kind of practice in that way at the monastery in Malaysia. And he was, and this is where he started saying like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. And that's when he left for Thailand to, to that cave that he already knew. Yeah, and you, you would tell one story where uh, he just, you know, he realized the, the tranquilizing, the relaxed step, basically, uh, that Bhante will talk about in the sutta, where that's where that, that crucial step comes in, the six stars. Bhante had this pain in his head from the Mahasi uh, technique that he was doing that wouldn't go away for a while. And finally he realized, oh, what if I was to try to relax that? Because in the suttas it's saying tranquilize the bodily formations, and so he uh, did that, and suddenly he, wow, there's the relief, you know? Oh wow, this this is working. So then he just kept going with that, and he said, this feels so good. I gotta go do my own self retreat. So he went to this cave in Thailand. <laughs> this is uh, this is where uh, the the wanting to call this meditation the oh wow meditation that's what he kept saying <laughs> but he named him twim <laughs> because, yeah, because there was another meditation called oh wow oh okay <laughs> i didn't even know this oh that's great otherwise we'd be practicing oh wow <laughs> <laughs> the the ow yeah. ow insight meditation it's really funny because for me, when I stumbled upon Bhante's teachings, it was exactly what I was looking for. Like, it was exactly the same thing that I was experiencing in my own meditation. I was practicing, whether it was vipassana or uh, absorption concentration, um, it always ended up like someone was like strapping a metal bar around my head uh, and just like tightening it and here. And I could sit through it because people kept telling me like, remain equanimous. Don't stay attached to the joy. <laughs> the word equanimity to me got very, very, very dry. So I don't really use it anymore. <laughs> but uh, for some of you already know that I have been there in Jedvan. But uh, yeah, so that's why you, you won't see the word equanimity in my translations. <laughs> It was just the same thing for me as well. Like when I heard Bhante explain what he'd been through and I started practicing what he was saying that it was the, the exact same thing for me. So it was just perfectly resonating with exactly what he found. And then he went to the cave in Thailand and um, lived with a cobra for a bit, I hear. And, uh, yeah. yeah, he basically... Uh, do, do you want me to tell part here? Yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> just. So he, like, yeah, he found a little friend in his cave, which was a cobra. Uh, but it was like a perfect cave. There was running water, which is key if you, you know, you're going to be bathing and everything. So, and it wasn't so far from the town where he could go for alms round. So he just told the cobra, if you don't bother me, then I won't bother you. And <laughs> I guess that worked. So he was there practicing for, I think, three to four months. And his daily routine was just wake up, uh, go for alms round, come back read the suttas a bit, and then practice, you know, sit the rest of the day. And he was just finally finding, finally finding what he had looked for for two decades, basically, or much longer than that, basically his whole life, uh, discovering something that finally worked for him and was taking him to these incredible, you know, blissful, you know, basically the jhanas that we discovered last night. And, uh, so this was like his major breakthrough, but then, and he said he would, would have still been in that cave maybe today if they hadn't come and actually got him, a monk from, you know, because he's supposed to be teaching retreats, and so they, they kind of tracked him down and said, you got to get back here and teach. <laughs> from, from then on, he just uh, started to put it all together and package it in a way that he, he, he could teach it. Um, I'm not exactly too sure how the, it all really started when he was teaching it exactly. But I think, so 
judging from um, his books, basically, then he wrote a book which was basically a commentary to the Anapanasati Sutta, which is the sutta we'll be looking at tonight. And um, that's his, like, basically his first book. And then he started realizing that people, because, because of the way that the uh, mindfulness of breathing is taught nowadays, that is like about focusing on the nostrils or whatever that uh, focus is, because of these uh, instructions, people were, had a hard time moving away from the, uh, the way that it's being taught right now, which is mostly from commentaries, and to the way that the Buddha taught it in the suttas, in the original discourses. So people were getting stuck, like going back to the nostrils kind of thing, when they're not supposed to really. We're, we're going to see that in, in the suttas. But, um, and so he realized that uh, also loving-kindness was bringing people there much faster. So he started moving away from teaching just the breath because he noticed that it came with a lot of problems just because the way it's being taught now, it created confusion. And then he moved towards loving kindness. And anyways, the loving kindness was like much faster. People were just like experiencing these states a lot, like really quickly. Yet he took the sequence of the, the Anapana Sati and basically package that into what we are calling the six R's right now. But basically what, what you've been practicing here is anapana, sati, but without the breath, basically, that's all it is. We're, we're going to see that in a moment, but uh, the, the, this is basically what, what it is. It's not like, uh, it's not really uh, different. It's just that we're using metta and right effort. Yeah. They said that people could get into jhana seven times faster with uh, loving kindness and the breath which makes a lot of sense because it's it's such a enjoyable feeling and it also is purifying the mind and naturally activating joy so it's kind of ingenious on his part and, and he, I think he also realized that uh, you know we grow up in really kind of like we all have traumas of some sort and, and so we're uh, you know, a lot of us are, are trying too hard or we're too hard on ourselves. So through teaching a lot of people, he really perfected and honed this over the years. And he wasn't teaching the six R's to start. He was teaching uh, the relaxed step, but he wasn't, he didn't have all the R's. And it was actually a, a student of his. I, so at the time he was using, uh, or for a while he was using an acronym called DROPS. Don't resist or push, soften and smile. But uh, eventually a student came, came up to him and said, uh, oh, this, I think this is what you're teaching. And, and he had written five R's down and Bonte added an R and that, that's the six R's. We usually don't, uh, we don't really want people to, uh, to practice anapana from the beginning because also there's other references in the suttas where the Buddha clearly started with the Brahma Viharas. Um, and then he would teach after that uh, the anapana basically because it's a bit more, a bit more advanced and um, if we don't uh, First, the progress is so much faster with that, and there's a lot of problems that don't happen later if you start with these really wholesome states. And so it's just much faster, and it's a really strong foundation. Um, the only times where uh, I would basically uh, give instructions on the Anapana is like uh, s certain types of people who are... Um, um, uh, like the loving kindness and the forgiveness will trigger like really like uh, deep trauma kind of within them and uh, there is no way that they could work with metta or forgiveness which would just like trigger even more trauma and for me I found that for, for these people like just smiling and breathing in breathing out smiling and uh, relaxing the tension in the body was like simple the simple enough that they could actually not trigger their whatever underlying trauma um, 
but that's really you know that's that's really not uh, the ideal situation uh, and definitely using the brahma viharas is by far uh, the best uh, the highway basically so that's or or later in the practice basically that's kind of how it becomes just being aware of the breath and like these seven supports of awakening that basically we're developing doing this There's a whole big uh, introduction to this discourse, and I'm not going to read it. <laughs> uh, basically, it's a setting where a lot of monks, and it's, it's quite like, um, it sets the tone for the, this really important sutta, because these are really important instructions from the Buddha, probably one of the, like, the most important instructions with the Brahma Viharas, basically, on direct meditation instructions. It's a quite remarkable setting there. Uh, the whole Sangha is there. Very advanced uh, Arahant uh, monks are teaching, like 30, 40 monks at a time, and everybody's really practicing. It's Vasa, the three months rains retreat. So all the monks are really going, you know, and um, unimpeded, and they're practicing really, uh, like, constantly and really well. And it's a very auspicious setting. And the Buddha just says, uh, exclaims just out like this, uh, I am glad about this practice, monks. This kind of practice gladdens my mind. And I just, I just love to picture, you know, like all these monks, you know. Like, and then it's like the Buddha is like saying like, I like it. <laughs> like, this is good <laughs> I like what you're doing monks like, please continue this is gladdening my mind I mean this is like quite quite something you know the Buddha saying that and that's I just love how even the Buddha can have you know an uplifted mind by seeing this like virtue happening Monks deploy even more determination to arrive at the unarrived, to attain the unattained, and to realize the unrealized. And so, basically, there's this whole story where um, now they kind of, uh, uh, they all go their separate ways, and then they come back after Vasa. Uh, and uh, the Buddha is basically praising the Sangha for, for, their, for their practice and uh, diligence. 